my next talk is bending and foil, which talks to us about flowing a classical surface by its mean radius of curvature. Okay, thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about mean radius of curvature flow because it's a nice example, but actually I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about curvature flows and some results, uh, recent results with uh, Wilhelm Klingenberg. Uh, around more general flows, but uh, I think mean ra radius of curvature, mean radius of curvature flow, uh, which sometimes it's referred to as inverse harmonic uh, curvature flow, which is not very um, enlightening, is kind of a nice one because you can actually solve it completely, so you can see kind of what's going on. Um, but before I do that, let me just talk uh, talk about a physical model uh, from which these types of flows might be of interest, which is if you look at a stone, say in a beach, or a stone in the bottom of uh, bottom of the ocean getting rolled around by forces, you can model uh, how it erodes by uh, abrasion. So if you look at a, a stone, uh, stone um, eroding by abrasion, uh, the physical model, well, and I guess it would, it would fit with what we would, uh, con what we would think might happen, would be that if you had a stone that looked something like that, that over time the pointier bits tend to get uh, get uh, worn off. And the bits that are sticking out as it gets rolled around or abraded by uh, interaction with, the <coughs> with its surrounding, uh, the pointier parts disappear. So it becomes, over time, it becomes less and less, it gets smaller, it's shrinking, and uh, the pointy bits somehow, the, the po points with the uh, bigger bits of curvature disappear quickly, more quickly. So what that suggests is that the maths model that we should use, um, so the maths will be, well, you take your, let's just take fix for once, we'll have a, a map from the two sphere into OR3. Um, throughout, I'll assume that this is convex, uh, smooth, closed. So I'll take the whole, whole map. So it, uh, sm uh, classical, uh, in fact, I would call this classical surface, uh, classical surface theory, uh, just because of sticking to this dimension. And what you want to do is look at a flow where the derivative in time uh, perpendicular projection is dependent upon the curvatures lambda 1 and lambda 2 of the surface at that moment. So this would be a general curvature flow lambda 1, lambda 2. So lambda 1, lambda 2 are the curvatures of the surface. Okay, so actually this is the class of, of flows that I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to talk about some specific examples of these. Um, of course, these turn up in lots of different situations. This model here would be where it's contracting. In this case, uh, your flow is a contracting flow if k is greater than zero and it's uh, expanding. It's expanding outwards, obviously, if k is greater than zero. So the example mean radius of curvature flow actually is, is uh, an expanding flow. Sorry, the other way around. Oops. Expanding for k negative. Um, uh, so I'll talk about both, in fact, by the end of, the, end of this talk. Um, now, usually for a model, uh, a physical model of abrasion, what you would want is that this equation, well, if you look at it, let's uh, set it up slightly differently. So if you take your, your surface and you take a point on the surface and draw the tangent plane to the point, there's your normal to the surface, and you look at the perpendicular distance here. So that perpendicular distance is what's called a, a support. So it's a function or, which is the support function of the surface, maps from S2 to or. And in fact, you can reconstruct the surface if you're just given this. Uh, in fact, this is the basic thing that we would work with now in terms of the flow. Um, for your support function here of your surface. Uh, and if you take this equation here, and write it out here, essentially, well, you get is minus k of, right. So after you do this projection, you find it's exactly the rate of change of the support function is equal to minus k. Now, what is lambda 1 and lambda 2? What are lambda 1 and lambda 2? They're the curvatures. Now, what are the curvatures? Well, in general, there are second derivatives in the support function. So in fact, this would be a, a function of or, the derivatives of or, and the second derivatives of or. Okay. So, that at least gives us a, an idea of what kind of equation this is. This would be depending on what f kind of function this is, right? You can obviously choose this function to be as complicated as you like. In general, this is going to be a second order fully nonlinear, fully nonlinear, because 
PDE. OK, now, w such a general thing is, is rather difficult to say anything about. There's all kinds of behavior that could occur, depending on the particular functional relation you hear, have here on the right-hand side. Uh, Well-known examples would be where you take, say, uh, the Gauss curvature as your flow. So k is the product. Uh, the other one, of course, is mean curvature flow. So your mean curvature would be another example of a flow well studied. Um, in fact, these would, in general, let's just say, if you look at these two flows and other versions of them, in fact, these uh, contract to a point. You can prove these contract to a point and becoming round as they do so. So becoming round as you do so. OK, in fact, this is true in n dimensions. So you can generalize this whole thing. You can talk about Gauss curvature flow and mean, mean curvature flow of a hypersurface in ORN. Uh, or, and uh, again, you can show that these, these types of flows are going to contract to a point uh, becoming round as they go. Now, one of the main reasons you can say so much about these flows is that these are homogeneous, that these are, this is a homogeneous function in the two variables, in the, in the eigenvalues of the second fundamental form. So these are homogeneous. Okay, and so because of that, you can say a lot. Now, it turns out in some physical models, in fact, uh, the Bleuer flow, homogeneous is not enough. You, you actually have lots of cases where there are interesting flows for non-homogeneous uh, functions. And there you can say much less analytically. And that's what I'm going to try and uh, talk about uh, now. I was talking about more general types of flows. OK, so <coughs> the, um, just for the rest of this talk, the first thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to take one particular example, which is where you, you flow it by its mean radius of curvature. So just to recall, I mean, your curvature is 1 over the radius of curvature, right? So in fact, the, this flow I'm going to look at is k. It's an expanding flow, and it's just the, the sum of the radius of curvature, or average if you want, minus 1 over lambda 1 plus 1 over lambda 2. Now again, that's a homogeneous one. But it turns out to be so uh, straightforward in some sense that uh, it's worth just having a quick look at. And then the second thing I'm going to talk about, uh, by the way, all of these flows, I should say up there, this, this, these are fun, fully nonlinear PDs. In these two cases, they're uh, parabolic, which makes things a lot easier to, uh, it's an elliptic second order operator on the right hand side, as, is, as it is there. So the second part of what I'm going to talk about is just more general parabolic curvature flows. Uh, so without any um, parabolic without any assumption on the specific form, except that it's parabolic, which I will tell you what that means in a little bit. Uh, so general parabolic curvature flows, and trying to look at kind of general uh, statements about them. OK, so in some sense, the first part of what I'm just going to talk about is the best case where you can actually solve the equations and see what they look like. And then the second one is where we try and use that as a kind of a, a model or an idea how you could uh, look at um, much more general flows, ones in particular that are not uh, uh, homogeneous. OK, so let me then state the theorem for the first. So, so under mean radius of curvature flow, flow there's, there's a few parts to this. I mean, uh, we have a, a preprint on this particular flow on some aspects of it. I mean, in general, in n dimensions, these, so many of these results are known. The first one is, well, what's going to happen if you have this flow under mean radius of curvature? So your surface is flowing outwards. Well, it just heads out to infinity and becomes a sphere. So, so what happens well, under mean radius of curvature flow? What kind of things happen? Well, or goes to infinity. OK, that's fine. Uh, the second thing you can say is that if you uh, rescale it, depending on well, say e to the minus 2t. So if you rescale it exponentially, then it goes to uh, a constant. It goes to a, a sphere center 0, 0 of a particular radius, which I'll show you where that comes from in a minute. OK, so this in R3, what's happening is your surface is flowing out to infinity. And as it's going out, it's becoming round. And if you rescale it by this exponential in time, in fact, it just goes to a sphere of a certain radius. OK, so this is very similar to that, uh, what you would see with uh, uh, Gauss curvature flow and mean curvature flow. 
OK, the third bit, and this is the part, I guess, that uh, has a different emphasis, is you could ask the question, well, if it's going out to a sphere at infinity, what's the center of that sphere? Right, to get a little bit more data, uh, so in the unre this, this is renormalized, so um, as uh, t goes to infinity, just pull it up a bit, um, the center, or sorry, the, the sphere at infinity has center. OK, the following. So actually, I can give you an explicit construction of what the coordinates of the center is going to be from the initial data. Um, so if you're, the center says x1, x2, and x3, well then x1 plus i x2 is one, no, 3 over 4 pi, so 1 over the spherical area times the integral of your initial support function times 2 xi over 1 plus xi xi bar integrated over the two sphere, where this is holomorphic coordinates on the Gauss map. So here, I should say maybe, coming back up here, if you take your normal, your unit normal to the surface, it picks out a point in S2, and then on this S2, uh, I've taken your xi coordinate to be standard projection right, on this S2 on the Gauss map. And that's what this xi is here. And uh, x3 is 3 over 4 pi times the integral double integral over the sphere of your initial support function times 1 minus xi xi bar, 1 plus xi xi bar ds2. OK, so what that's saying is that these points, you take your initial surface, you've got its support function, you integrate it up like this, and you'll get, another, you'll get a point, and this point is actually inside, this, inside that initial surface. And as the, the sphere goes out to infinity, it eventually converges to the sphere uh, which center at that point. Okay, so this is the extra claim, if you like, there. Okay, so let me show you, and say, because this is a reasonably straightforward case, uh, let me just give you a quick insight into how we can prove these three statements. The first two. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I've chosen to project from the, <laughs> from the North Pole. <laughs> okay, so you could express this entirely in terms of the spherical harmonics on the sphere in whatever coordinate system you want. Okay, but I just wrote it down quite explicitly with that. So again, choice of coordinates on the Gauss map and fitting in R3. Okay, gives you that. Okay, so how would we see that? Well, <coughs> let's just have a... It's actually quite a nice proof. You can prove that, by the way, the first two statements there also uh, work in ORN. The latter one you'd have to do a little bit more work, but it's probably true with some variation, slight variation. Okay, so let's see, um, how, we, how could we prove that? Well, if we come back up here, let's see, um, our support function. The, the key thing is that uh, for the radius of curvature, the radius of curvature, uh, the mean radius of curvature, um, so your k, is R1 plus, well, minus, sorry, because we're expanding, R1 plus R2. And it turns out that this is precisely uh, the Laplacian of the two sphere on the support function plus twice the support function. So this is a, a key thing as to why mean radius of curvature flow is so much better than other types of flow. So what that means is, let me just grab that, your flow is ddt of or uh, minus the Laplacian. The spheric, this is just the round spherical Repla Laplacian equals 2 or. And now it's a linear equation. So actually, when I said fully nonlinear in the first case, this is the one case where it actually linearizes completely in the support function. Now, because it's linear, you can actually express everything in terms of spherical harmonics. Right? So you can project everything onto, this is or as a map on the two sphere into, into uh, the reals. So therefore, uh, if you use spherical harmonics, so you can break this down into, say, a sum from m equals 0 to infinity. Or sorry, I usually think, think l from 0 to infinity, m equals minus l up to plus l right, of your spherical harmonics. Uh, OK, so y, l, m, which are functions of or and theta or whatever. And then we've got your constants. Let's call them a, l, m. So that's, we're writing this, so 
uh, write our function on the sphere in terms of spherical harmonics. And now that coefficients become a function of time. And so you can actually flow this, you can actually explicitly solve this equation. So you project it into its eigenspace of the sphere of the Laplacian. And the equation becomes that the derivative in time, actually this is the ordinary derivative now because it's just on the coefficients which are constant uh, other than time, of ALM is um, 2 minus, well, what are the spherical, when the <laughs> spherical, uh, when the Laplacian acts on this, each one of these will give a different coefficient depending on L into L plus 1 times ALM. Right, because there's the Laplacian part, if there's the eigenvalue of the Laplacian, subtracted from 2, well, that's just a, an ODE, its solution is exponential. So you can explicitly write down or is the sum from L equals 0 to infinity, from sum from M equals minus L to L of, well, uh, your initial one, let's say A, L, M, and 0, times E to the uh, 2 minus L into L plus 1 T and Y. So you actually integrate up, you get an exponential term here. Okay, so when L is 0, this is a positive exponential term and it, bro it blows up. So you can see from that, just write the first two terms. First, first eigenvalue when L is 0, uh, you have A, L, well, a zero, okay, so I'll put zero. Zero, zero, in fact, is the uh, at zero times e to the 2t. And then you get the next two terms. Well, when l is one, in fact, the exponential is zero here. So, in fact, you'll get a one zero y one zero plus a uh, one one y one one plus a one minus one y one minus one plus and now we have exponentials with negatives. Right, so the, it's going down as you go along. Sorry about that. And as you go along, so it's a positive exponential in the first term, constant term in terms of t, and then of course at the end you have e to the minus t, because you go for that spectrum the exponential. Okay, so you can see immediately uh, the first two terms. Obviously, as t goes to infinity, you've actually solved the equation, so all you've got to do is let t go to infinity. It <coughs> will not stay on for some reason. Um, however, the other hand, you have this middle term here, which is kind of a constant term, and then here, e to the minus t, e to the minus 10t, right? all the negative exponentials. So as t goes to infinity, this is getting bigger, these are staying constant at zero. So you can see or is going to infinity, and if you multiply across by e to the minus 2t, well then you just get this term here. And what is that term? That's the, well, it's the projection onto the zeroth, uh, um, zeroth um, spherical harmonic, which is just the integral over the sphere. Right? So you'd integrate the support function over the sphere, and that's the radius you get for that one. Now, okay, so that's the first, if you like, first two parts of the theorem proved just by sol solving using spherical harmonics. Now, of course, the key thing there was that it was uh, linear, which allowed us to project onto the, onto the spectrum of the operator. So. Okay. Okay, what about the third bit? How do we show that it, um, in fact, converges to a sphere at infinity with a given center? Okay, so the way in which you can see that, or maybe even interpret that fact, So the way to look at the second, the third part here, how would we show that it, it um, converges to, uh, well, the center in some sense is, is these points here? Well, in fact, <coughs> for part three, what we do is something slightly different. The way we approach it is if you look at your surface and you look at the oriented normal lines to the surface and watch how they flow, 
So track, rather than the actual surface, track its normals. And what you find is that the normals converge to the normals through this point. Okay, so that's how we find this center. So <coughs> in general, so if you're given the surface S contained in R3, so the image of that map I was talking about at the start, and so here it is, and you look at the oriented normal lines to it, well, each oriented normal line, if you look at the set of all oriented lines in R3, so the set of all oriented lines is a four manifold, it's a TS2, and it has lots of nice structure on it, um, which I'll come back to in a bit. But anyway, a point here, uh, sorry, a line here will be a point here, and then as you vary over the whole surface, you'll get a whole surface here. So you get a surface in the space of oriented lines. Now what we show, and I won't go through the proof, is that this line, by the way, it's, it's, it turns out to be Lagrangian with respect to the canonical symplectic structure because uh, it comes from a surface in R3. So these are integrable as you go across, so as you uh, go around these lines. Um, and what we do is we write, write as a flow of a Lagrangian surface in, in, or th in TS2, Grangian surface. And actually, it, it, it's linear. It turns out to be linear as well as Lagrangian surface in this four manifold. And what we show is that while the surface in R3 is going out to infinity, the lines are converging. Right? So we actually get a convergence result in this space. So we write as a flow of this Lagrangian surface, and then we show convergence show convergence to a quadratic holomorphic section. Holomorphic section of TS2 section. OK, what is that quadratic holomorphic section? Well, it's parameterized as a three-parameter family. And that three-parameter family are precisely uh, the three numbers that appear here. So these three numbers here in the second of the, of, this is under the flow of the uh, support function. These are precisely A01, A10, A11, and A1 minus 1. These are usually writ written in complex notation. And in fact, that's all this is. This is the support function projected into the first non zero eigenvalues, which is a three dimensional space, which gives you exactly the three, point, the three <laughs> coordinates of the point in R3. OK, so <coughs> what? Overall, I said the first two are well known in n dimensions. This last fa fact here really comes about because we look at it in the space of oriented lines, and then we show convergence. It has better convergence in the first derivatives, if you like, than it does in the underlying function. And when you translate this all through, what that means is you can actually show that the normal lines are converging to the normal lines through this point, right, while the surface is running out to infinity. So this is uh, TS2, uh, so it's over S2. It has a complex structure and quadratic holomorphic. It, you can write it locally as alpha uh, plus beta xi plus c xi squared. So it's 2 to 1 over, over S2. It's just, yeah, it's just, a, it's, it's pu. So it's in no, no, it's a. Uh, we take it's a it's just a section it's a quadratic global quadratic holomorphic section of TS2 and actually the three coefficients are because it's Lagrangian it's instead of three complex coefficients they turn out to be three real coefficients which are exactly those three numbers there okay. just think of it as a graph over from C to C locally if you want okay so <coughs> here in some sense is the kind of the best possible case because it's linear, not only is it, well, it's parabolic, uh, this is a parabolic equation, but it's a, a linear equation. And so therefore we can solve it by simple, simple enough methods. Now the second thing I want to talk about is more general flows. Um, however, in that, um, they're going to be more general, but they're going to be um, parabolic. So the first thing I'm going to assume, as we'll see, is uh, they're going to be uh, parabolic any parabolic flow is going to be the uh, one that I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, or going to assume. The second thing is that I'm going to look for more qualitative features. 
So kind of, can we get an idea of what this flow looks like in more general, either the contracting or the expanding one? We don't really mind which. Search for qualitative features. And the third thing is to exploit the low dimension. So some of what I've said earlier, or much of it, can be done in any dimension. But I want to exploit low dimension. I want to expo somehow exploit the fact that we're only looking at a surface in, in R3 rather than higher, a, a, a hypersurface in a higher dimension. Um, now, the, out <laughs> well, the outcome of, what we, of these considerations, well, the first thing we get is, and I'll talk about that next, is that we'll have kind of a new way to looking, uh, looking at this, so a new visualization tools. And uh, as a consequence, it also kind of is motivated by the variables you use. And when you write things in those variables, as is often the case, you discover some uh, new geometric structure. Um, now, of course, new geometric structure in classical surface theory is always something that's worth uh, looking closely at. The particular um, structures I'm going to talk about, we discover that there's a hyperbolic metric on this curvature space. So we get a hyperbolic metric. And not only that, then we also find that we have a kind of a Hamiltonian ODE behind these curvature flows, which gives us a good thing to compare with. So we also have a Hamiltonian ODE structure. That's what I'm going to try and get to. Um, and OK, well, once we have all of that, it turns out then that for a general parabolic flow, what we can do is, you know, we're never going to be in a situation where we're going to be able to say explicitly as much about any solution for a nonlinear PDE uh, as you have for that linear one. But what you would tend to try and do is kind of bound quantity. Say, well, if the, as it flows, this quantity doesn't change more than a certain amount or this quantity. So you kind of hem in the flow. You try and kind of get a bound above and below for the flow. So you can, you don't know exactly what happens, but you know it's in this region. And then you can rule out certain types of behavior. So um, what we find then is these general estimates for these types of flows. Estimates. So for, for these parabolic flows, essentially what you do is you compare, the, you use the parabolic, because it's parabolic, we assume it's parabolic. So we use the parabolic maximum principle uh, to compare principle to compare, uh, compare the PDE with the ODE, with this ODE I'm going to show to you. Right, and once you can do that, then you can, well, you can at least see a solution of an ODE guiding a PDE is a, is a very strong situation to be in because, you know, we can always, given any particular ODE, we can always numerically integrate it and get an idea of what's going on with it. Okay, so let me try and explain those three points. Okay, so let's start with the first part. So what, what kind of new visualization tool? Well, as I said, initially we had the surface in R3, and then to prove the second part of what, or third part of what I talked about earlier, we looked at the space of oriented lines and reinterpreted it in terms of a flow in the space of oriented lines. And the space of oriented lines is kind of like a geometrized first derivatives. If you think about it, it's kind of the rate of change around the surface. What I'm actually interested in looking at going up one more derivative to the radius of curvature space. And in particular, the image of a surface in this radius of curvature diagram. So recall that we have a convex surface. So we have a convex surface. Uh, so we have the radii of curvature. We forget about the curvatures. We just talk explicitly about the radius of radii of curvature. And let's assume that we pick an ordering on them so that R1 is greater than or equal to R2. That's certainly all right. And then we're going to define two new variables. Uh, which 
for reasons that won't be immediately obvious from what I'm about to say, but which uh, I'm afraid I can't avoid. It's the average and difference between the radii of curvature. Okay, it's the normal sigma because it turns out this is a complex function. In the background, there's a complex function giving us this, but you could call it whatever you want. Let me just call them psi normal sigma. So this is uh, the, the, the um, obviously this is strictly greater than zero. So this is the, just the sum and difference of the radii of curvature. And think of the map that goes from S2 into, well, these two, or two, which takes a point on your surface to its curvature as well, to its psi and norm sigma at that point. It's, a, it's average and difference between its radii of curvatures. Uh, well, these are both positive numbers, so in fact you're into the upper half plane. So this is a mapping into the upper half plane. So this is what I would call radius of curvature space. So it's the space of, it's just the image of the radius of this sum and difference of radii of curvature. In fact, <coughs> if you look on the radius of curvature, you will want, of course, the sum to be bigger than the difference. So if this is psi and this is norm sigma, you expect convexity which means that your surface is going to be sitting in there somewhere. It's going to be in that upper triangle there. Uh, what kind of, what would it actually look like? Well, if you take a generic surface um, and you, you look at what the image of it's going to look like there, it's going to look like a different color. So this is the convex region. So assume our surface is convex. Well, first of all, notice uh, along this point, the norm of sigma is 0. And the norm of sigma is 0 precisely when the eigenvalues are equal. And these are exactly equal at umbilic points. So in fact, the umbilic points are the boundary. So the umbilic points are where your radii or curvatures are equal. So your umbilic points are now at infinity in this upper half plane model. And your surface is going to look like this. In fact, in general, it's kind of going to have four of these points. Now, it could have folds, right? So they may not be isolated. There's lot, you know, there's lots of, I'm just trying to draw a generic surface. This is the image. It's a s mapping from a sphere into the upper half plane. So it's going to be double covered in the middle, for example. And here we'll have our umbilic points. If they're isolated, they look like that. Now, it turns out there's a lot of information on this diagram that, uh, for example, the angle at which it comes into the umbilic points turns out to be a real analytic invariant of the surface. So there's lots of information that you can get out of this. Um, what's also interesting with this surface is that if you take, if you take your surface in R3, and you flow it out to a parallel surface. So you move it out along its normal line parallel. Right? So move to a parallel surface, a fixed distance, whatever, one or two. So if you do that, move to a parallel surface, what happens on this radius of curvature diagram is it just moves in a translation parallel to the, uh, to the axis, to the boundary here. So this is so parallel surfaces. You just get the whole picture, and you just push it sideways. Now that's not a, par that's not a parabolic flow, obviously. Uh, there's constant flow. On the other hand, if you scale, if you scale everything in R3, well, it essentially scales everything in the origin here. Scales in H3, sorry, in R2 plus. But both of these are, in fact, hyperbolic isometries. Right? So scaling in R3 and moving to a parallel translation, uh, parallel surface, are hyperbolic isometries of the upper half plane. So in fact, there's much more detail. There's much more in it than that. So let me state the following theorem. Uh, if you take your surface S2 and you look it into TS2, look at it, the space of oriented lines. Right? So as we said earlier, you can get a new surface sigma. Right, it goes to a surface that sits inside S2. And this has a metric, G, which has signature 2, 2. And if you look at the curvature of this metric, OK, so you look at the curvature, let me see, I'll say omega of G evaluated on this surface, this symplectic, uh, this uh, curvature 2 form, that turns out to be precisely the hyperbolic metric pulled back from here. So it works out to be the pullback under this map here 
into R2 plus of the hyperbolic metric. Yeah. Hyperbolic area form, actually. So in some sense, we, uh, this hyperbolic metric on the space of curvatures is somehow it's critical in, uh, well, it, it both in terms of its invariance properties, but also in terms of the relationship with viewing this surface in R3 in its one jet or its two jet. Both of them come in. Okay, so given that then, what do we want to try and do? So the idea now <coughs> is under a radius, uh, under, under a flow, a parabolic flow, is to look how does the image of this radius of curvature map uh, flow. So that is the next topic. We look? So the question then, how does the radius of curvature diagram of a surface, the radius of curvature diagram I just mean is the image of this radius of the radii of curvature, it's some indifference of the radii of curvature in the set of all such curvatures. So how does the radius of curvature diagram change or um, move as the as you flow the surface in R3 so surface in R3 okay so this is the question um, so the answer well I'll give it at least symbolically so we can try and compare uh, we can at least pick apart some of the things so if we say V then is just psi norm sigma so this is just points in your hyperbolic space so in your curvature space, then the flow of V is, well, it's not exactly the Laplacian, and it involves a free function which is not uh, the, it's basically the direction of the lines of curvature rather than the actual curvatures of V, plus a quadratic term V, uh, plus with, um, Actually, it's norm of sigma times k, which is a minus, I think, k. So this is the general structure. Now, each one of these terms are obviously complicated. Here, I'm just uh, summarizing the overall form. So here we have at the top, the first fact is that it decouples. So notice this is a vector, so this is a system. So what we're doing is we're looking at the flow, this parabolic flow in R3. We're looking what flow does it give in uh, this two-dimensional space, the space of curvatures. Uh, when you do that, we'll no we notice that it decouples. Now, the reason it decouples to top order uh, is because of the kodatsu minority equations to top order. And this is technically because of, well, kodatsu minority gives us this. So not every, so for example, it would be nice if every mapping into the sphere came from a surface in R3, but that's not the case. If you give me a mapping from the sphere into, sorry, into this hyperbolic space, into this curvature space, that does not mean you have a surface in R3 that gives you that. There's a condition, a compatibility condition, which is Kodatsu minority, or its derived version. Okay, because of that, it helps us here, it decouples the equation to top order. So it's, it's a parabolic, well, it depends on the original operator, I guess. The second part here is this is quadratic. So quadratic actually in the derivative. So this is like second order term, first order term, zeroth order term in some sense. Oh, no. See here? Um, so quadratic, that's a quadratic term. And here it is a Poisson bracket. So the Poisson bracket here is with respect to the canonical coordinates d d psi and d d norm sigma. So these are canonical coordinates with respect to this. 
Okay, so what does that mean? How do, how do we go about this? Um, well, first of all, the idea is you take your three terms here. You assume it's parabolic, so you can use maximum principle on the second derivatives. You find conditions where this quadratic term has a sign, a positive or a negative sign. And then you can compare your original solution with the solution of the ODE. So, oops, okay. so you compare with the ODE that DDT of V is just V. Um, now, for this, K here is whatever curvature you have flow, whatever curvature function you want to choose to flow by. I'm assuming it's parabolic. So this is an ODE, and it's a Hamiltonian ODE. Right? In two dimensions, we have enough first integrals. We've got one first integral that's enough in two dimensions. So in fact, you can, you can integrate that. So what, what, what that means is a parabolic flow doesn't matter what the explicit details of what the k is, except that it's parabolic. Um, you, in good circumstances, you can compare the solution of the PDE with this ODE. Right? I should have a minus there in front of it, obviously. With this ODE. So for example, if you look, for example, if you look at this mean radius of curvature flow, what does this ODE look like? Well, um, it looks like this. It's got it, sorry, I never actually cross it. Exponentially goes down to zero for ra mean radius of curvature flow. So you can see you're, you put this in here, and it won't f exactly follow these flow lines, but because it's parabolic, it'll be bounded above and below by these flow lines, and in fact, then you can control the flow, even if you didn't. Okay, in this particular case, we can explicitly solve the problem. On the other hand, if you were just to look at mean curvature flow, uh, so mean curvature flow is a contracting flow, so you don't expect it to go out to infinity like that. For the ODE looks like the following. It's actually just straight lines to the origin. So there you can see mean radius of curvature flow, the ODE is just trying to get the whole thing, shrink it down to the origin. And I should say for Gauss curvature flow, you have a similar picture except the profile aren't straight lines. But again, you can always, you can pick any curvature functional and you can solve that ODE. You can just write down what that ODE is. And when you do so, then you have a, a guide for how the PDE is going to work uh, uh, if it's, well, I'll say, if it's parabolic. OK, so how, what does that end up uh, giving you? Well, the final part will be to actually get some kind of quantitative estimates on flows that allow you to say something about particular cases. Now say, I'm not going to work on particular cases or say anything about particular cases. I'm going to try and make it as broad as possible and make it um, the, the estimates that we get as general as possible. For specific flows, you probably will be able to extract an awful lot more. Uh, but the theorem. So let me just mention the estimates. So, so uh, so let me just make, first of all, so a flow is parabolic. So the first thing I never, I've mentioned par the word parabolic so many times, never actually know what does it mean to be parabolic. Well, as I say, it's, it's somehow that this, second, this operator on the second derivatives, that the Laplacian part is bigger than the, uh, is bigger, that dominates the wave part. Um, so what is it? Well, it's the fact that if you take your functional and you differentiate with respect to psi, and it has to be negative because it's a parabolic when you want the right direction. You want this to be strictly bigger than the derivative of k in the norm sigma direction, and actually the normal. So that's the parabolistic condition. So any functional, so this, as I said, this is, is it satisfied by mean curvature flow, radius of curvature flow, Gauss curvature flow, Bleuer flow, lots of different flows satisfied. These, are, these would be the prototypes of erosion models that I started out talking about. So it's parabolic if that's the case. OK, so then assume it's parabolic. So, so for a parabolic flow with, OK, so the other thing I'm going to want um, is, let's let me write in the right order. Uh, so what I want is that the Hessian of this, so with k convex. So for a function, again, of two derivatives, uh, a function of two variables, you can talk about it being convex. It's just the Hessian right, of the second derivative being positive. So let's also assume it's convex. 
than any h, so we call it h because it's kind of like a Hamiltonian, from the hyperbolic plane into R, which with three conditions. The first condition is that h uh, is, it's kind of like there, it's elliptic. It's greater than the norm of the same thing. Two, it's convex. So again, its second derivatives are uh, positive definite in its two variables. And the third condition, it's that it's a Poisson inequality that h with k is strictly greater than zero. Actually, you can reverse all these inequalities and we get the estimate the other way. Then, throughout the flow, h pulled back to the surface is bounded by the maximum of h pulled back to the initial surface. So we get an estimate on that quantity. So it, for a convex parabolic flow, well then any convex function, well convex elliptic function, which satisfies this Poisson inequality, is bounded throughout the time of the flow. So again, we've made it as general as possible, but you can change some of these. There's a lot more technical things. You could drop convexity and you can still extract certain things. OK, but again, this is for any flow and one that has any, um, you know, the, doesn't really matter as long as it's parabolic and convex. It, doesn't, it can be expanding, it can be contracting, it can be whatever. OK, and again, the idea is underlying this is the fact that if it's parabolic and you're quadratic, this term here has the right sign. That's what these conditions ensure. Well, then you can compare your flow with an ODE flow. And once you can do that, then you can start bounding quantities. Now, in practice, you would have to know the specifics of the flow. If you want to get real detailed information, you would then go further in, in the particular case that you're looking at and find these estimates uh, that might suit or are easier to extract for particular flows rather than this general framework. OK, so that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Yeah, that would be, yeah. Actually, the time at which it gets to things is often harder to get to than to. So in general, what you would kind of do is you have your surface here, and you choose your function h, and you'd find its, fl its flow, its uh, equiang, and then you'd say, OK, it's going to stay inside that. <laughs> that would be the kind of bound we have, rather than how long will it take to get from point A to point B. And so this is more of a. a something that gets rid of time and says, oh, no matter how long you go, you're never going to get bigger than that. It doesn't actually tell you when you're going to get to any particular value. So I can't say. It is true that if, if you take, for example, Gauss curvature flow or mean curvature flow, you can say exactly how long it'll take to get to a point. Right, but there, again, it's homogeneous, and you can extract a lot of information from it. You know, so. Thank you.